All right. Well, I think we've gotten, you know, we were, we got a lot to talk, talk about. So um, we will definitely go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again, everybody for, for joining us today. Um, we're, we just got a, a fun, fun hour filled with, um, exciting stories and then advice that we hope everyone will find, find useful. So we'll just welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm Dan DeClos, founder and CEO of PlexTrack. Um, I'll get the uh, slide moved here. Um, uh, excited to just be on this panel with everybody. Uh, well, I'll let everybody else introduce themselves and then we'll kind of dive into the content, but, um, Casey, why don't you, why don't you kick it off? Certainly, thanks for having me. So my name's Casey Ellis. Um, as you can see, I'm the founder, chairman, CTO of Bug Crowd. I'm also the co-founder of the Disclose IO project. Basically, been in security, you know, since before I actually had a career, um, and it's uh, continually escalated, um, you know, ever since uh, that that first thing all kicked off. We'll get back to that later. So yeah, nice to nice to be here. Great to be chatting. Yeah, thanks thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, uh, Nick. Yeah, what's up? My name is Nick Popovich. Uh, I'm an offensive security researcher. Uh, focus has been on kind of that that adversarial assessment, pen testing, red team. Wore a lot of hats, military veteran, uh, worked consultatively, worked internal red team, and um, really excited to just talk about the different trajectories, different paths, and kind of combining all of our experiences to, to show you some interesting uh, avenues into cybersecurity worlds right yeah no thanks for joining us again nick i think i think this was kind of kind of your fault yeah we mm-hmm. had you on the webinar and and uh, uh uh last month right and uh you're like oh man we could do a whole webinar on on getting started in in cyber and like well why don't we do that <laughs> so uh joe uh go ahead and introduce yourself sure my name is joe perini i am plex tracks product evangelist um, I've been in cybersecurity for 20 plus years, uh, active penetration tester for 15, practice manager. Uh, the thing I enjoyed most probably was taking new pen testers and watching them grow, you know, where they, they learned, they were, they were passionate, they were excited, they end up being, you know, now they're practice leaders and, and tech leaders. So that, that was always fun. So I'm really yeah. happy to be part of this panel. Because it's yeah. uh, something I enjoy a great deal. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. Um, um, so, kind of just the outline for today, and and then we'll just kind of turn it over to kind of more of a of a, a discussion. But you know, we'll, we'll each kind of share our individual stories of how we got started. I think I think all of us that have been in cyber for a while, we get asked this question a lot: How do I get into cybersecurity? You know, and and everybody's had a different journey. And I mean, uh, it's it's fun to <clears> see. <throat> the different ways that people do get in and, and then how we can help how we can help you know the next generation of, of, of security professionals get in and and you know some of the key takeaways that I think we've all learned from being in the industry so we'll we'll, we'll talk about that and, and 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 give our you know kind of collective advice as well as how do you continue to develop and enhance your skills and then how do we how do we avoid burnout which is obviously a, an important topic uh, in in this day and age uh, especially uh, in cyber um, because of just how much pressure we tend to feel but but definitely for the audience definitely feel free to use the q and a function in your in the webinar controls to ask any questions and we'll try to we'll try to either answer those in in real time or we will uh, we do have some time reserved at the end to answer questions as well so feel free to uh, this is definitely meant to be interactive so feel free to participate um, but uh, let's start with kind of everybody's kind of personal story um, you know how you got started and how we got in how you got into cyber um, I'd love to kind of you know maybe Casey you kick it off and then you know we can go Nick and, and Joe and I can I yeah, can sure thing. do 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 the uh, do the rounds of the uh, the Brady Bunch Zoom thing we got going on here <laughs> um, yeah. yeah so I mean you know as, as y'all can you you can probably hear um, asking where I'm at currently is it's California in, in the US. That's not why, where my accent's from, uh, born and raised in, in Sydney, Australia. Um, and we've been back and forth from there basically since the start of, uh, since the start of Bug Crowd, uh, which is coming up on about nine years ago. So hmm. that's like the recent history piece, but getting into security in the first place, so th- there's a couple of things that happened. Um, one was that, you know, my old man was a science teacher. So, so I, I grew up with this like, 
<clears throat> you know, really kind of fostered curiosity in, in tech and a lot of opportunity. I was, you know, quite quite lucky, I think, in a lot of ways to get access to a lot of technology as a part of him, you know, taking me to school and bringing things home and, you know, tearing crap apart and putting it back together and all that. So that was <clears throat> kind of my environment growing up and something that um, I, I think they did a really good job of identifying as a, as a curiosity in how I thought. So that was that was one part of it. I think as I was getting older, <clears throat> what I also started to realize was I really enjoyed thinking like a criminal, but had no desire to actually be one. Um, so, so this idea of like, good call. yeah, well, yeah, and not everyone, <laughs> not everyone makes that decision, but I, I think a lot of folk in security already will probably get what I mean by that. There's this fascination in what it looks like to operate without rules, to get in behind the closed door, like all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but then there's this moral or this ethical kind of line that you've got that, that basically prevents you from causing harm. Um, a lot of the people that we work with in, in the bug crowd context, you know, really the idea behind the company was to gather as many of those folk together as possible and plug them in to problems that exist in the market. So that, that was kind of my, my background. Uh, I tripped over into an uh, IT apprenticeship. I did about six weeks of a nuclear, um, nuclear physics degree uh, out, of, out of university. I was going to go into medicine. Um, sorry, out of high school and basically realized that I was only doing it because that's what I was told I, I needed to do next. Like I was curious and interested in all those different things, but I hadn't really developed conviction about what I wanted to do and ended up, as I said, stumbling into IT, started hacking stuff. People liked it. All of a sudden I realized, oh my God, this is something that's actually a viable career path. I can use this kind of adversarial mindset, this kind of opposite thinking thing that I seem to be good at and really enjoy. <clears throat> to, to deliver value to people. Um, and that's how the whole thing got started. I moved across into sales at one point, uh, actually after I got married, my wife sat me down and said, you computer good, but you people good too. Um, not everyone can, can necessarily do both. Maybe try your hand out on the business side of things. And I listened to that. That was really, I think, salient advice. Um, her calling out something that I didn't really recognize in myself at that point, but she, she was right, as wives often are. Uh, and it kind of went from there into entrepreneurship. You know, I was, I was a CISO for a period of time. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that uh, gets into the, the kind of the later stage of my story arc. But probably the big thing is that it's just not ever been conventional. It's, it's always been, you know, the next opportunity actually looking and, and having an open mind to, to what to pursue and gradually zoning in on the things that I, I loved the most and got best at doing. Um, and it just being a continuous process of that. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, um, I love thanks, hearing Casey. the story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy telling it because it's, it's partly, I mean, it's fun, right? Like I've got fond memories and it's always fun to talk through that stuff, but also like, you know, I came to the U S to do, to do bug crowd, like for, for a period of time, there's like massive imposter syndrome because I didn't have, a, a completed university degree like i lecture in universities now i've been doing that for the past five or six years you know different things like that where it's 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 unconventional in a way that i actually think makes it accessible for a lot of other people it's like if i can if i can do this stuff if i can pull it off then you know people that uh have an ambition to do the founder thing in the way that i have or that want to get into security whatever else they can probably do that too so that's that's why i like to share it that's great. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, Nick, how are you? How did you get, how did you get into this space? Yeah, I, uh, I, at 17, all my friends were going to college and going doing things. And uh, I said, you know what, I want to just graduate early. So uh, I graduated early and I decided I wanted to try out a career in technology before I either went into academia or school for it or, or got a job as like, so I enlisted in the army. And I focused on when I joined the Signal Corps, got a chance to get paid to, to play with bits and bytes. And from that experience, um, I love I, I moved into private sector, working public sector, private sector, kind of the jack of all trades. Because when you're in the military, it's just if it has code in it and electricity, it's your problem. So I got exposed to a ton of, of different uh, aspects of technology through the military. And then that translated to what I wanted in my career. So I started looking at, you know, going the help desk route and, and played around with help desking and systems architecture, network engineering, played in the IT ecosystem space for a number of years. 
And then actually my, my hand was forced. I was on a contract and they said, we need a security person. Um, you need to get your CISSP to start studying for this stuff. And I was like, that was my, my entrance into security was actually as an IT auditor, which was neat. But I took that IT audit role and really wanted to understand more, just not the, are you meeting the spirit of the control, but the technical aspects, the ramifications of, okay, the control says, do you have a firewall? But what does that mean? Is it configured well? That actually ended up leading into, uh, in around 2010, uh, becoming a professional pen tester. So I spent a significant portion of my career uh, on the red side, the red team, focused on consultative penetration testing, moved into leadership, practice director, those types of things. Also explored um, internal uh, corporate red team uh, roles, which is is different. It's 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 the same, but it's different. There's there's similar aspects. There's different goals, um, but and then really the last couple of years have focused a lot on that kind of bridging the gap of it's not us against them. There's it's not an us against them. It's a collaborative mentality of the idea of you know whatever the terminology that's used at the time. You call it purple team. You call it collaborative assessment. But the idea of really the whole point of being uh, of assessing as an adversary would is to gauge the profit, the the effect is effectiveness of technical controls. And so mm-hmm. really that's been my passion is researching different mechanics and methods to hone my skills as an adversary, but for the purpose, just like Casey said, the purpose is not just because it's to feed my ego. The purpose of everything that I do is to help raise the security posture of organizations that are, you know, somehow related or under my purview, something on those lines. So spent some time in academia, um, teaching adjunct, spent some time building labs and ranges and really, really love, um, I love the idea of not just gauging my success off of individual pursuits, but now what feeds my hunger is gauging my success off of other people's success. Um, that sounds kind of smarmy, but it's just really rewarding to see either students or folks that are that are coming up around you. Like, like Joe had mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking offline, um, when you're running a practice or you have a bunch of people who you're helping direct their natural talents towards success and helping them execute excellence, uh, that just rewards you to a different level, in my opinion, than I did really good. My goals have been met this year. So, um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. I am a nut. Nutshell. Nut. <laughs> but yeah, yeah don't give I up your day job. But you got to be this guy in cyber, right? So there is that. Yeah. There is that. There is that. Yeah, nice. Joe, Joe, tell us your origin story in cyber. <laughs> well, because I'm the gray beard here, my origin story goes back a few more years. But actually, I started um, back when I was an optician. Uh, I, one of the, the careers I had was I made eyeglasses for, uh, I started lens crafters and, and uh, then worked in optical lab in Napa, California. And the doctor had an old 8088 that he we used to use for calculating the lens curvatures. And he said, Hey, you want it? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, um, I took it home and I was trying to get online with it. My father had given me a U.S. robotics, uh, 1200 baud modem, the one that's about, you know, yay big and it's made out of aluminum. And I'm trying to figure out how to plug it into the back. I run down to radio shack, get an adapter and Nothing's working. And I realized that I had actually spent all that time and money trying to get the thing plugged into my printer port. (laughs) And it was at that point, I'm like, I like this. And I spent some time trying to figure out how I could do computers, but I was a single dad and I really couldn't afford a lot. So I started a nonprofit organization called the uh, the Recycled PCs Program in Napa so that I could go out get computers from businesses, and then I taught an adult ed class on upgrade and repair the IBM compatible. And from there, I worked as a, as a sales guy at, at a value-added reseller here in Napa, and the network engineer took me aside and said, I'm very disappointed you haven't knocked over my network yet. That tells me that you're not really trying. I'm like, okay. And he, from that point, taught me, and then I I went and got a gig at uh, as a system administrator at an e-commerce developer in Petaluma, California. And th- we would have strange events where all of a sudden our SMTP servers would disappear and w- they would be replaced by FTP servers for zero-day wares, where they were basically, they weren't trying to steal anything, they were looking for places to host 
um, videos and music and things like that. And that got me interested in the security side of the house. It's like, oh, okay, well, I got to keep them out. What does that mean? I got my CISSP, not that that has anything to do with, with pen testing or security, and then went to work for uh, HackerSafe, which was bought by McAfee. And then I started with a QSA company and uh, went in as an auditor. And I discovered that auditing is eight hours a day of people lying to you. Uh, <laughs> they're not. Uh, and being a system administrator, I know this because I know what it takes to do seven the job. Hours and, seven hours and 45 minutes, maybe. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, bio breaks, certainly. So maybe let's bring it down to seven hours with lunch. Um, but the fact is, is I know you're not doing it because you don't have time in your days. And I had the chance to take over the security lab for this QSA. Um, and I jumped at it. And I basically didn't know a heck of a lot. I had learned the external penetration testing from HackerSafe and would enjoy doing that. Uh, but uh, I hired some really good people and they taught me and that that was really that's all I've ever done is just hired smarter people than myself and then just shut up and listen to them and do what they told me and built uh, a, a, some ex a lot of experience in running practices and I really enjoyed one of the biggest challenges I had as a practice manager is we didn't have a business model where we could hire those those people who you know are going to be good. You just look at them, you talk to them, they have that passion, they have the fire in the eyes, but they don't have enough time in the seat for you to be able to put them in front of a client or bill for their time. And I would have to pass on them and that would kill me. And I would do whatever I can to try and find them a place someplace else or whatever. So it's really important to me to provide resources for people who are up and coming in the industry. Uh, and I've said a couple of times while I was posting on LinkedIn and Twitter for this webinar, find me another industry that goes out and does what we do in terms of supporting people, providing knowledge, education, free resources, doing whatever we can to bring you in to InfoSec and cybersecurity. I mean, they're not doing that in accounting. They're not doing that anywhere else. I mean, so we have something really special in InfoSec and I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, that's oh, that's great. Yeah, and th thanks. Yeah, thanks for your story too. So, um, yeah, my I, I always kind of tell people like I have probably like the most formal way to get into cyber that I've that, that I've heard. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I uh, you know I went to college and I was a computer science major and wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do when I graduated, but I started to kind of take an interest in security um, towards the tail end of my senior year. Um, more from like, you know, how these, like, it, it, this is 2004, right? So like viruses are, you know, rampant and curious how like Symantec and McAfee and all these play, people are detecting them. And so that, that was kind of like, it was kind of just an interesting, you know, phenomena to me. Um, so I started looking into, into ways, you know, how, how do you get into cyber? I, I, I always did have a kind of a more missional mindset in terms of, you know, wanting to help people. Uh, this was in an era where at least a lot of folks in my program, they were really interested in like writing video games and there's nothing wrong with that, but I just, it just didn't, that didn't motivate me. I thought I'd want to go into like healthcare or something, something where I felt like I was helping people or you know, helping an industry. And so then security just kind of appealed to me. Um, and I, 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 I kind of, you know, fortunately fell into a, an introduction uh, from somebody that uh, had been in cyber and uh, and and told me about this program through the Naval Postgraduate School and introduced me to a gentleman by the name of Chris Eagle, which I'm I, I'm 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 assuming some people know who that is, um, but uh, uh, you know he he introduced me to that um, uh, and introduced me to Chris and then got me you know kind of information about the scholarship for service program. So uh, so I applied to that and and got in, and uh, so I went to the Naval Postgraduate School and, and got a master's degree in computer science with an emphasis in security. And just a fantastic program. It was, you know, it was a guaranteed job out of school, <laughs> you know, in, in, the, nice. in the government, you know, and, uh, and I just got to rub shoulders with some just in, 
incredibly smart people uh, and um, definitely had imposter syndrome, but just, you know, loved every minute of it and loved the program. So, so I got, you know, I got a degree, I got trained formally in cyber and started my career in the Department of Defense, wearing a lot of different hats, you know, things like incident response and vulnerability management and and then started to kind of just be more attracted to the penetration testing side of the house having two degrees in computer science i was more more um more attracted to the the web application side of, of hacking and penetration testing and uh so then just kind of continued to work uh in different in different companies um i was a principal at vericode for a while and and that's where i that's where i kind of started to uh, you know, as I, as I did pen testing engagements, I hated, hated writing reports, hated the fact that we come back a year later and, and basically rewrite the same report. You know, I, I didn't feel like, I felt like we were doing good work, but I didn't feel like it was always getting, um, the mission accomplished in terms of like actually helping people improve their security posture. Right. And so that was, that was really kind of the impetus for Plex track, but, um, you know, I, I just always had this, I always had this goal of, of helping people, um, I, like similar to everybody else, I loved, you know, understanding how things work and, and things being a big puzzle. Um, so that, that was kind of my, kind of my start and, and, you know, why I've kind of been in, in the space. Um, uh, I do want to kind of remind everybody, I see a lot of stuff happening in chat. If you do have any specific questions, please do throw those into the Q and A and, uh, you know, and, and we'll, we'll address them as we go. Um, I think there's a button, right? There's a special button that says Q and A, that that says Q &A. Yeah. Hit, hit, hit that there, but, um, hit that um, button, perhaps, ring the bell. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to answer any, any questions as we go, but yeah. So it's just fun. It's fun to hear everybody's kind of story of how they got into cyber. And I know everybody's different and i know i know we have kind of a, a penetration testing focus uh you know because we we're all friends or you know friends of friends and and so i think that that, that the pen testing circle is is a little small right um yeah but uh, the you know the the, the the cyberspace is 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 quite vast and and wide um so I, i'd kind of like just kind of get everyone's a take take on like you know how do you how do you, what kind of advice do you give for somebody trying to get in, right? Or, or somebody, you know, looking to get into cyber and, and what are, what are the typical things that you tend to advise people on? Hmm. So real quick, are, Dan, are you the only one on the, on the panel that has a college degree? Or do we have, uh, I actually, with? no, yeah, I, uh, I got, you uh, got undergrad and graduate degree. Okay. Um, in cyber or uh, uh, related probably. field? Probably. I don't even remember. It's a bachelor's degree in information technology and a master's degree in. I tried hard. No, it was. Uh, I think it was called information <laughs> assurance back in the day. <laughs> at at one that, point, at one any point, of that degree you're said, using? Uh, I tell you what. I tell you what. You know the thing about college degrees, um, and I know <laughs> that one thing that I'll kind of put out there and say is, um, I think that there needs to be in everything, just like Thanos has taught us, balance. And everything, right? There's not one size fits all, or I guess you could go to the force, right? In between the light and the dark, there's balance. I think the one size fits all model needs to, to leave your perspective and understand that there's so many different um, ways that people react and, and assimilate data and backgrounds and learning capabilities. So the one, the one of the things that I think about higher education is that I tell folks, do you have to have a, a degree to be successful in this? Not at all not even by a long shot. I know tons of folks. And then they say, well, as you say that, why do you have degrees? For me, I found that I wanted to build off of theory. So where I think higher education sometimes can be valuable. Now, granted, those degrees I've gotten over years, and I was already kind of half established in a technology degree and a career as I, as I got those. Plus, let's be real, the Army not only paid for them, they paid me to get them. So I was uh -huh. leaving money on the table if I didn't get those degrees sure. with the, the post 9-11 GI Bill. Um, but uh, the cool thing about a degree is while it's not necessary. It can aid you with the theory and the building blocks. But what I find is people end up thinking that their degree is going to be everything they need to practically hit the ground running and just go and execute immediately in their job. And, and that I think is a little bit of a, of a, is a misnomer, maybe a disservice from folks who are guiding them along because they finish that degree and they get hit in the face with, with I, I don't want to say real life, but with real life. Um, so yeah, that's, I do have a degree. 
I have a master's uh, and a bachelor's. Do I have to? I don't think so. Have I? Do I think it's aided me uh, in certain you know, the ability to understand how to do certain types of research? I think it's helped some, uh, for sure, for sure. I I understand that you can get good critical thinking skills from the experience of going to college. Plus, you develop relationships and networking. But the first thing that I hear a lot from folks is, how do I get started? What degree should I get? Should I go to college? Mm, and I've been, call. you know, I've been, I didn't get a college degree to become an optician. That was uh, something where I was taught by a master optician. And, you know, I've even, I was apprenticing back, before I was an optician, I was apprenticing to be a furrier. So I've had a lot of alternative uh, education and in cybersecurity and, and in hacking, it's, it's all been self-taught or as I said earlier, I hire smart guys and just copy them. Community um, so it's, that's my approach and I'm, I'm of the side of the argument that says, nah, you don't need it. Besides, by the time you get out of college, everything you learned is going to be obsolete anyway. So that's why I was asking of the folks that we have on the panel, how many of us do have degrees and whether or not there's an advantage to it. It's, it's interesting because, yeah, as, I, as I mentioned, my, my father was an educator. Um, you know, my, my mom, since they're actually kind of both fairly entrepreneurial <laughs> as well. Um, she went back to college once, uh, once we were old enough as, as kids and um, got her master's in clinical psychology, started a practice uh, down, down in Australia. So they're, they're both believers in education. They've both done a lot with it. Um, <clears throat> And you know, I think the thing the thing that I've often thought about with uh, with that question is is like what's best for you because there's there's certain people that that really need mm -hmm. or really appreciate and respond well to the structure of of higher education and going through through a series of degrees um, or a degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you know this this flip of it, like if you can't access that, it's not necessarily something that's yeah, you know, evenly distributed in terms of people's ability to get access to higher education uh, or afford it or any of those other things. So, you know, from from my perspective, it's automatically not the answer because you're if it is, you're all you like you're exclusive at that point. You're not being inclusive of of the you know full range of diversity and the talent that we actually need to stay ahead of the bad guys in this space, right? So it's like, okay, it's it's a it depends, which is like the classic. You know, here's me drawing on my consulting years now. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of an it depends answer and i think it, 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 it varies depending on the individual it's, it's yeah. one of the reasons like <clears throat> the um the whole bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure play at like domain mm. with, with self basically self-motivated research that has a point of proof attached to it mm -hmm. like we've seen people actually jump into that and use that as a way to get into security from from the get-go as young folk um but even as as folk that get into security later on in their career they've been working in cars for example and now you know i want to get into automotive security so i'm going to go hack some cars and learn how to do that then all of a sudden i've got proof that i can and it becomes evidence uh for that for their career path there's all sorts of different ways to do that and obviously the one that we've built i'm a fan of um it's a bit biased <laughs> but it's still true <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's this balancing act between having having gone through and had structured learning even having a foundation of things that you can take and actually use you know in in um security management for example like you could i, I see people i personally do this i take from what i've learned as a musician um and use it in leadership and management it's got nothing mm -hmm. to do. It's got nothing to do with security, but there's these adjacencies and what you pick up along the way. I think security is <clears throat> about as broad a cross-functional set of problems as you could ever expect to interact with, and and you can usually find a use for just about anything. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of what is best for you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I. You know. I I, you know, having having a master's degree, having come from a family where you know every everyone had a high, a higher education degree, 
it wasn't it wasn't so I guess it wasn't so much like this is what you have to do. It was always I'm a perpetual student and and loved learning yeah. and just enjoyed you know gaining knowledge. And I and I and so when when people ask that question of me, I was like, I, I, I tend to tend to kind of agree with Casey. It's like you know, your education is what you make of it, right? So whether mm-hmm. whether you go and and get get your education you know out of a out of a degree, that's not where your education stops. And 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 so and if you're just going to go try and get a cert, it's like what's your motivation for getting certifications or degrees? You know, is it yeah. is it to have that piece of paper that says, yeah. hey, I know something, um, but or or you know, in turn intrinsically, have I mastered a concept? Right. And I'm, and I continuing to, you know, have that approach of like, there's still always more to learn. Um, so that's always been my take, you know? And so it just, I I just feel kind of like I fell into it (laughs) to a degree, you know? Okay. Um, but, uh, fell in it to a degree. I caught that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I think the interesting thing that, and, and I've only ever been in cyber or cybersecurity, right? So I don't know what other industries are like, but one thing that I love about our space, you know, and Casey, you alluded to it, um, is that we do have a community where we, we really do try to teach each other, right. And try to try to, I mean, for the most part, I mean, we know there's some people out there that couldn't care less about others, but like, I think for the most part, most of us in this space are, are genuinely people that want to help other people learn because because we recognize that there's opportunity and there's there's a need and and how do, how do you how do you reach people that that didn't have the same opportunities that we've had right and so always trying to kind of grow the grow the community and 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 perpetuate it forward i think is an important aspect to call out and um, you know, we're getting a ton of questions, you know, but like, no, no, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you, you know, how do you get it? You know, some of them, you know, some of them kind of relate to like, how do you get started? Like, you know, how do you, you know, I mean, I think we've talked about it before. I mean, there's, so there's certainly some of that initial initiative, um, but just getting involved, you know, in, in local, in local security groups is, is definitely one way, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I've seen that have that that work effectively, you know, around here. But I'd be curious what other what other advice you know the, the panel you know provides. Well, something that resonates well and I've seen pretty successful is to to start with the the I guess kind of cop out and say, well, it depends. But then going to folks and saying to them, look, let's let's bucketize. What is the difference between? Um, experiential or on the job training, which is, I think, one of the most valuable. And then there's, there is a difference between like education and training. So like it, when you have education, that's teaching you the fundamentals and the theory to build off of. Then you have training. That's more like techniques. At times you think about techniques and then you've got on the job training, which is then the culmination of you've learned methodologies, you've learned techniques, you've got a fundamental theory. And then certifications, I think, would kind of lie in this gray area between techniques and education. There's this a certification kind of goes along with training because you've learned something that's a little bit more practical, um, but then it's about this wisdom, how to apply. So wisdom is, ta- is, is knowing how to apply knowledge expertly or in, a, in an appropriate context. And so one thing, though, that I like to tell people that is, I think, one of the most important things to do, regardless of if you're doing uh, a free online training, and there's tons of free open resources, there's a lot of great blogs, there's a lot of great training, um, focus on the why and the what of what you're doing versus the how. I think sometimes training uh, will fall flat because the training focuses so much on the how, a tool, a technique, a methodology, something that's coming in uh, that's 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 a how. Now, that's going to change. The how is going to evolve. I mean, I think the number of Office 365 password spraying <laughs> tools on GitHub will show us that there's always going to be a new technique and a new how. But mm-hmm. fundamentally, focus on why you're doing something. Why are you interrogating that service? Why, what do you hope to gain from the activity that you're doing? If you take every activity and you distill it down to, so that you start to understand the, what you're doing, what are you actually doing when you run this tool? Are you interrogating a service? Are you sending packets? That's the biggest thing that I think can help people. Because if you focus just on training that teaches you the how, you're going to be very into kind of a scripted, and I don't mean like a scripting language, but a very scripted uh, situation where you can't improvise, you can't adapt. When things don't go the way you expect, you you have you focus so much on the how that when the how doesn't work, 
you are don't that, really know. Yeah, that knowledge becomes why. fragile. Yeah. 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 You need to know how to do SQL injection before you start using SQL map for, good, for that very reason. I, I, ideally, yeah. ideally, and, and I'll, I'll, ideally, like, I, <laughs> I think, um, you know, given, given what sort of bug crowd sees and does, you know, we, we, we've interacted with hundreds of thousands of hackers mm -hmm. over, over the years, people that are like tenured, you know, security career folk, and then people that are just completely rookie coming into it. Like we've had a, um, Probably one of my favorite stories is a is a thirteen year old kid who who got uh, suspended from school for hacking his lunch ordering system and um, <clears throat> got an introduction to us because his his mother was freaked out. She thought, oh, he's going to be a criminal, like this dirty hacker person, rah, rah, all of that sort of stuff, <laughs> and got introduced to us as like, yeah, that wasn't the right thing for him to do. But the fact that he can do it and the fact that he's got those kind of skills, that's actually pretty pretty cool. Um, let's see if we can divert him, you know, actually take advantage of that and, and divert it onto a, and onto a positive track, uh, instead of having it, you know, potentially spiral off into a life of crime. Right. So there's all of these different variations on, on how it plays out. And, and really the biggest thing that I would say is that, um, you know, the advice I give folk is just try as many different things as you possibly can. Like the, like cybersecurity as a domain is so unbelievably broad and diverse, um, in, in terms of how you can apply your skills, like social engineering, you know, we're talking about web app sec, we're talking about net network security, radio, cars, medical device systems. You can get to you know, focus off into different verticals, like different industries. So, you know, supply chain security and like SCADA, like all of this different stuff. You know, I, I really encourage people just to taste test as much of it as they possibly can. And that's where I, I kind of indexed a little bit on the, like, ideally, if you're going to go deep on web app security, then yeah, you know what SQL injection is before you learn how to use SQL map. But flipping that, if the goal was to like, okay, what the heck is there out there for me to be able to engage with? Then in that case, you know, just playing with tools and getting an understanding or a feel for how things work, I think mm -hmm. is pretty, pretty yeah. cool. Absolutely. I always say yeah. play with the tool, play with the tool, Hundo P, Hundo P, Casey, <laughs> but watch it through a proxy, yeah, yeah. watch Wireshark, yeah. start, yeah. don't be happy with the tool and the cool ASCII art and the colors, learn what, watch the logging or look underneath the hood of the tool. What is it doing? I think we're, I think we're a hundred percent on the same page. <laughs> but my point yeah. was that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff that I learned early on just from picking up tools and, and no playing doubt. with them and then starting to do that, learning what was going on and, and coming no in doubt. from that angle as well. I think one, one of the that things that, I'm oh. sorry, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no, as I say, I think one of the things that helped me is like not only, you know, being feeling freedom to tinker and have playgrounds to to learn and explore, but also like tapping into the community to, and, and feeling okay to ask questions, right? You know, and I think that's an important part um, that we talked about, I think, in our prep for this is like the power of your network, right? You know, the, the community does genuinely want to help. And so don't be afraid to ask questions, right? You know, it's how do I, you know, people, people are kind of, there's a theme of like, how do I stand out? How do I get, you know, how do I get into this? you know, into this field when I'm, you know, kind of finishing up a degree or, or changing a career path. And I think, you know, my, my thought process immediately goes to don't be afraid to just ask questions and tap into people. You know, I mean, I, I think that, that probably some, some folks might think that you know, there's this intimidation factor with certain personalities or just in general, in, in, in general, in any forums. And, I think that's a really important thing, thing like, you know, get tapping into the B-sides, you know, and the ISSAs mm -hmm. and, and the ISACAs and, and being, being okay to be vulnerable and say like, I'm still learning, but I want to, I want to grow. I think, I think, you know, if any, if there's an employer, if there's one aspect that an employer looks for, it's that, that humility and that initiative, right. Can I mean, community up? involvement too? community right, involvement right. on the resume goes, I, I remember looking at resumes and seeing that they're, they're doing these CTFs or their meetups or, you know, this meetup, that helping meetup. out with a conference. So yeah, yeah right. uh -huh. that put, put those accomplishments on there and invest in it. And then, then to all of us crusty security folks, we have to be conducive to that and don't be jerks yeah, to yeah. people. That's a really that's a really important call out, by the way. Sorry to sorry to jump on top of that real quick. But <clears throat> that whole idea of as you're trying to distinguish yourself, as you're trying to differentiate, as you're even thinking about like, oh, that's great, go join a community. What does that even mean? Where do I find mm -hmm. one? Um, those those sorts of because people can have those questions and they're legit. Um, 
So actually looking through the different things that you've that you've done from a career standpoint, um, you know, especially in cybersecurity, but even if it's outside of that, and you're starting to talk about volunteer work, community development, you know, being a part of the military, being a part of um, healthcare or like EMT, uh, you know, different things like that, where like this is a pretty fiercely altruistic uh, industry that we're in. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of technology, the money's good, all that kind of stuff. But the reason that we're here is to make the internet a safer place and defend users that can't do that for themselves. So if you've got that in your backstory, it's, it's actually relevant to call that out, I think. Yeah. Now, as a hiring manager, I'm, I'm going to take this to a pragmatic level. So, yeah. you know, people are asking, well, how do I get started? And we've been talking about, you know, there's a lot of resources and getting involved in the community, don't being afraid to ask questions, but you need to have foundational knowledge. So when we talk about, I, and you probably see this, Casey, where you've got folks that are using the tools, don't understand how they arrived at the destination. And that's great. But if I'm going to hire somebody, they need to be able to defend their findings. They need to understand why, the why and the how of it. So, you know, starting having a background in IT is helpful. No, having knowledge of at least one programming language because you're going to want to automate a lot of what you do. So it's easier to do that in Python or Rust or Go or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's this the foundational experience that will help you tie things together when you see them in the environment because you're you're there you're doing a pen testing and pen testing is two things it's it's finding that initial vector and then it's finding the attack chain that gets you to whatever your target is the PII the the HR data the the financial data the Coca-Cola secret formula whatever um, so you need to be able to understand that okay I'm in now what no and as if you've got a background in IT, in IT, you understand how networks work, you understand how the domain's been put together, you begin to understand the flaws that you might see. Because sometimes it's tools and it's a specific RCE or a weakness and whatever, and other times it's just a bad configuration. So starting with that foundation in IT, maybe a smattering of programming, I think is probably answers the question of, well, where do I start? And then from there, by all means, you know, do the CTFs, do the, the community events, do everything else, but start with some basics. Um, we can. at Plex, tra- yeah, well, I think if you can, I think you're, you're going to have to, at some point, you're going to have to have that knowledge. I mean, so that, you, that, I think that, voice, be- that voice, that advice works pretty solid. And I would even say that that's a good for somebody at the genesis of their career. Um, and then I've, I've worked with folks who are well into their fifties, just starting out trying to get into cybersecurity from those different things. So again, not to just be that constant caveat, uh, cop out dude, but you know, ideally would you get exposed to a significant amount of different technologies and be able to build on that? That would be the super ideal. And if you're at the very Genesis of your journey and your story, and you have the opportunity to get involved in technology in some fashion, cool. But otherwise, uh, there, you know, Getting involved, and if, if it's not your nine to five, if that's not what you, you don't get paid to sling code or you don't get paid to be a technologist, don't feel like um, the doors are closed or you, you're too old or uh, you're, you're in this, uh, you know, a position that, that it's just not in the cards for you. There are paths to be able to do that, uh, to be able to succeed. Because some of the things that I tell people a lot is that your nine to five doesn't really feed you. So if you have a job as a help desk person, one of my first jobs outside in the army was a help desk person. That was valuable to learn troubleshooting and a bunch of cool stuff. But, um, and, and I value that, that I got some time as a server administrator and that really helped me and built me into this, the, the technologist of who I am. But that nine to five isn't feeding me for that next step, right? I'm, lear- I'm not learning how to be a better technologist. I'm troubleshooting. I'm going to tickets. I don't have, you know, my nine to five really isn't, defining me as a technologist. It's that the, the, the passion projects that you can uh, be interested in and maybe you get time to do it during the work day. Uh, maybe you don't, but I think, uh, yeah, I, I noticed you just posted something. Tell me about what, uh, what the thing yeah. you just posted is Joe. So a uh, couple, um, two things or one thing first, before I, I talk about that, I think your passion projects as a hiring manager, if you want to stand out and you don't have uh, a lot of time as a consultant or, you know, experience, if you put your GitHub 
yeah. on your resume. 100%. It's, that's huge. I mean, demonstrate what you do know, what you're passionate about. If we can teach you what, what you need to know, what we can't teach you are soft skills and the desire to be the hacker, to, to, to put together the puzzle. Now, what I put in the, um, in the chat section was for everything is something that, that uh, I've been doing as the Plex Track evangelist is putting together a list of you know, hacking resources, everything from how to get started with uh, cheat sheets and, oh gosh, there are so many uh, pen testing labs you know, live fire ranges where you can, oh, that it's just gorgeous. <laughs> what you can do uh, with these live fire is just like you were on somebody's network, you hack the hell out of it, but you can do it safely and without um, having to go to jail over it. Hmm. So, and then there's uh, links to YouTube uh, folks who are providing free education and training, thought leadership. So you can go over to our website to uh, plextrack.com, Hacking Resources 2022. And this is a living document. So at, over time, I mean, I checked it this morning, two of my links were dead. So I had to go through and clean it up real quick. So this will be updating on a regular basis and we'll keep it fresh. But we'll provide this because we want people to, as has been pointed out, get experience with a lot of the different technologies uh, that breadth. And then once you define what you, gets you excited, then you can begin to drill down on what's important to you. Yep. Yeah. And, so and thanks, I, Nick. Lovely setup too, by the way. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, no. That's good. Is that going to be emailed out? You know what? Funny you should mention it. All of the, uh, the folks, all the participants today will go ahead and get a copy of this emailed to them. Man, and Casey, Casey put put some bug crowd resources in in the chat as well. If you scroll up a little bit, you know they're bug crowd right. university. I mean, I I love the bug crowd. I mean, I love the uh, the just the bug bounty concept, right? Because like when I got started in AppSec, that didn't exist, right? <laughs> you know, so like you know you you're, you couldn't you you know. For a for a squeaky clean guy like me, I had to be very you know <laughs> you the labs have to be quite stuff, judicious right? about yeah. How you, yeah, go about, yeah. You know, in 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 lab work, you know, is great, but it's mm. not always like you know real life where you know like a lab in a lab work, you know, there's something wrong, right? And 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 so you're you're gonna find it um, eventually. Um, you know, in a in a in a standard pen, pen test, you, you're pretty confident something's wrong, but not necessarily exactly sure where where you're going to find it. But uh, so those are great resources. I'm going to go ahead and jump straight. I mean, we've got a bunch of questions, and I know we're kind of kind of running uh, <laughs> running out of time. We're not going to get to all of them. Yeah, but um, oh, so we'll we'll just kind of dive into some of these here. But um, um, you know, you know, like you know, where can I volunteer, you know, as, as I, you know, we've got, we've got someone that's, that's kind of moving out of a, out of a current career field into another one. Where, where are some good, what are some good resources to volunteer? And I think we kind of talked about some of that, but what would you guys, you know, recommend uh, for volunteer and, and showing that community involvement? Schools, man, all the high schools around always want somebody to come in and help them out with stuff. Yeah. There's also non for profits out there. I don't, I'm going to get their names wrong. And these, these are in Virginia, but I bet you every state, like there's tech for good or good for tech. That's like nonprofit tech folks, tech for true. There's, there's a lot of nonprofits that need uh, folks to give their time. And sometimes it's, it's just silly. So that's some stuff. Also, real quick before I give the mic up, I got to say that with, the, I love how Casey was like, you know, there's a problem in technology. And so I'm just going to, have a hand in creating an entire industry to solve it. But, but, but hey, yeah, I'm a little crazy like that. I, that's, that's what one of the things before. that I love about the bug bounties is that that's such a beautiful place for people to go get started. Like, like yeah. it, it, it labs awesome. are great and it's true, but you want to go live fire and be, deal with a very number of apps and in real life. Now I can go and, and there's really the barrier to entry has been lowered so far with the uh, bug bounty that that's one of the first things I tell people is go get yep. involved in bug bounty programs. And I understand they can be overwhelmed, but that community as well, uh, the bug bounty community is, is just like any community. There's, there's ups and downs, but for the over, overarching members are very welcoming to, to folks. Yeah, absolutely. Follow I'm, the rules is the one piece of advice I would give I, you. Don't go outside yeah. the scope or rules of <laughs> engagement. Cause that'll get you kicked off a platform faster than you can say hello. 
so and, and, and possibly arrested as well and just just throw, throwing into the um on on that with and thank you nick i appreciate that that was you know one of the reasons i started the company was you know keep my buddies out of jail uh and, and give people that are coming into this uh, like a, a lower barrier to entry path into into being able to hack for good um and you know think bad do good all those all those good things um the disclose io uh link that i just posted so disclose is basically an open source project around um standardizing safe harbor making it making it safe from from a legal standpoint uh to to submit or to report issues that you might find in in um in companies and that's that can convert into okay by the way you're now allowed to go and test to us uh test to to people that are out there or it might just be if you see something you can tell us and and not need to freak out that we're going to you know, call the FBI or do whatever else. So I think that's that's a part of um, that's something to look at. You know, when you, when you're thinking about uh, how you could just directly contribute, and I, I do think hacking on something that's live, even if you haven't really figured out how to create good results yet, it does it feels very different to doing to doing a lab at home. So even just getting that experience, I think, is important. But yeah, disclose IO um, from a volunteering standpoint. You know, we, we're trying to make it so that the internet's immune system gets kind of fixed up in terms of all these laws that <clears throat> basically penalize and shield the work of people that are trying to trying to help but look kind of like a bad guy as they're doing it trying to fix that particular problem that's a place to to help out and contribute and evangelize um the other one i was going to throw out real quick is um you know your local defcon or, or b-sides group there's there's you know always an opportunity to go in and help out and they've usually got communities you can you can jump into and then pl places like, you know, uh, women in security and privacy as an organization, like they're focusing on getting more, more women and making basically information security and privacy more inclusive for women. Our, it, is, it is definitely, our, there's, some, there's some biases that we've got to still do a lot of work to overcome in, in this. Our space. resource document has a, a link to a great list for uh, women in STEM. Mm, uh, so I would encourage anybody uh, everybody to look at that for starters, because, you know, uh, the men in the room need to be able to support the women who are trying to break in and give the opportunity. The other thing I posted was, uh, a link to, uh, infosecconferences.com because every conference is looking for volunteers. Yeah. So that link will set you up with the conferences that are current, might be local to you, and you can reach out to them and volunteer. Dan, what other questions do we have? Let's see. What is uh, so when you don't have a degree, what is a good way to stand out to recruiters in this field? You know, we kind of touched on. I think some of that. Um, I think. I think when when you're in your resume, I think definitely having a, a, a section, you know, that that highlights your your projects, you know, and interests, you know, and things that you are uh, volunteering in. Um, that that does and should stand out to recruiters, or it should it, it should stand out to the right people that you're looking to 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 be working for, right? I mean, I think I think we <laughs> we see all the time like people getting lambasted for hey entry level uh, entry level cybersecurity engineer needs the CIS master's degree, degree right? and you know, yeah. with right. five years experience. Years. <laughs> so those There's are an, not if you, you if, want to work if you're for. looking at a place that has an entry level job that requires a master's degree, stop looking at that place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, don't go work for them because that's <laughs> also, terrible. While, real quick, while we're on the resume idea, um, using the term familiar with, like I said before, when you're that help desk job, when that auditor, oh. when you're whatever that that day job is, if you are labbing it up and you are exposing yourself to tons of technology, saying that you're familiar with technologies, uh, listing out the technologies you're familiar with, I can tell in an, because when I went to that job as a server admin, was my job as a help desk person being a server admin? No, it wasn't. But I was familiar with setting up two-way transitive trusts and AD replication. And you know how they knew I was familiar with is just words. But then when they went to talk about it and I could speak to it educatedly and because I'd done it myself with labs, that is valuable. Now, when you use the term familiar with, make sure that you are yeah, legitimately I'm, I'm, familiar yeah. with <laughs> the technology. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, that's why I made that face. It was like familiar with... I've seen enough resumes where basically when you talk to them, okay, they were in the same room as 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 this thing happening and this technology being put together. Yeah, I know. But that's, but that's how you can highlight lab experience and experience. Because if I look at a help desk person's job, I keep saying help desk because that was where I started. I'm not ripping on the, the help desk person. 
like I said, they have, if they go out there and do a lot of self-research and they get exposed to a ton of technology, how do you break the barrier of the glass ceiling of your current day job? Your current day job, you need to break. If, if you're trying to accelerate and evolve, you have to demonstrate how. And so being able to, if you just list every technology in your resume, you better be able to back up every single technology you list on your resume conversationally and in a scenario because that uh -huh. will turn a resume, that will turn an, an interview from an hour in about 15 minutes. Yeah. After I talk through and we, I very quickly understand that you have put a lot of stuff on your resume that you hope will get by the word filters of the hiring software that's looking for buzzwords, but you can't speak to it experientially. Then and the and the role isn't one that is a, a junior role. Something most like yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be a well. You know, do you have any more questions? Because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just I just posted a link. Um, so we we did we, we've got Bugcrowd has a, a basically virtual conference um, that we've that we put on called Level Up. Uh, there was a talk by a guy named Ricky Burke on hacking your resume. Um, just going back to that question, like it's full. Like that talk is literally full of, of Ooh, answers nice. to that question in terms of okay, like yeah. I haven't done this. Like how do I blah 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 all that kind of stuff. So I do recommend that for people that. Are interested. Sweet. Sweet. That's very cool. That's very cool. So Dan, um, this stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I I'd like to point out that you know one of the things that you can do to get started in this industry is to be kind. Be kind to everybody you come across. Be kind to everybody you talk to. Uh, Dan and I met what ten years ago. Yeah, something like probably that. something like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind. Dan, were you kind? Well, no, Joe was Dan, <laughs> Dan was asking, yeah, Dan was asking questions about what, how to get into cybersecurity. What? Well, I was, I was, I was trying to kind of branch over to pen testing. You know, I'd been, I'd been mm -hmm. more in the certification accreditation world, and and you know, had been more on infosec management, and just I had missed some of that exploit writing and stuff from my grad school days, but hadn't really kept up on it. So I. I I was taking the OSCP and then just, I'd gotten introduced to a gentleman by the name of Eric Milam who introduced me to Joe. <laughs> nice. And I talked to you for what, 15 minutes to an hour. Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's probably, probably a good hour, you know, just yeah. advice and how to, how to be a pen tester really. So, and then three to four months ago, I was out looking for a job and Guess what? <laughs> the conversation I had with Dan because I took an hour ten years ago to just kind of explain what I was doing, what was the door that opened for me to come work for Plextrack. Yeah. So, so the the lesson there is be kind to everyone because you never know who you might want to work for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, just yeah, be yeah. you can have whatever you want in this world if you just help enough people get what they want. Yeah. Right? yeah, Zig Ziglar. But, and also uh, there's and also there's an opportunity to pay that forward. And frankly, for people that haven't had the time to build up that social capital yet, there's I think a, a grace for actually asking for that help. Um, it's it's really easy to underestimate how much folk that have had who've been around for longer or have who like who've achieved things. I learned this early on in entrepreneurship. It's like I can't go talk to that person. They they never want to give me the time of day. When in actual fact the fact that they've been so successful or done, you know, the kind of things that I wanted to ask them about actually made them want to help because they're they at a point in their career where they were wanting to pay that sort of thing forward. So I, just, I think just being aware of that, if you don't have like at least some degree of imposter syndrome in the mix, then you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about that. It's just, it's a more a matter of managing that than trying to avoid it completely. Um, that's just something to throw out there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting to see imposter syndrome because I have it all the time. <laughs> and yeah, and as a pen tester, lifelong, no, yeah, lifelong. like as a, as a pen tester, especially because you're like you get into the end of the week, you know, or however long the engagement is, you're like, man, I have not found anything. <laughs> I am the worst. I am positive there's something here. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That goes with something that I like to tell people. First off, I think you'll have imposter syndrome for life, and that's good. That means you're not suffering from hubris and, and a pride issue. Like, but don't compare yourself to those who you look up to. Compare yourself to yourself last year. Yep. Right. So that's just some advice. And yeah, imposter syndrome is real forever, forever. Yeah. How you manage for all it. of us forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. 
We've got probably time for one more quick question. Um, and, and, and I know we've kind of, because we're pen testing, you know, background, we've kind of had it a little more focused on this, but um, there's definitely some questions about maybe some, how do you branch into some of these other fields? One of them specifically around threat intelligence, um, getting into the intelligence side or cybersecurity. I don't have as much background there. I mean, I know I've worked with threat intelligence people, um, but I don't know, Nick, do you have any you know advice there or Casey or Joe? I, I, I would just say kind of similar to what, you know, how it is in pen testing is kind of open up into the, that community and, and, and learn and show what you're working on. But I'd be curious what you guys think. Yeah, exactly that. I, I think with, with TI and, and you know, general intelligence work, doing, doing your own research and trying to figure out novel ways to, to answer hard threat intelligence questions. Um, there's so many different ways to, to kind of improve that space that if you're already thinking in that direction, starting to work on it on your own, um, is is a good thing, but then yeah, joining communities, um, you know, look look for look for places where people are doing this this type of work and digging into it, like the um, the OSINT and and um, like social engineering. There's a, a weird, I think, more accessible crossover into TI through that group because they're kind of doing similar things. There's adjacencies, hmm. so just working out what the pathways are to to get you into the right um, the right rooms, and then once you're there, like. Shut up and listen. Uh, the one thing with threat intelligence is you gotta you gotta you gotta watch your slip. Like like if you're prone to um, you know the whole like TLP red TLP yellow discretion side of it, like that space is ultra ultra sensitive to that. So if you struggle with that, maybe think twice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Well, um, we have reached. Uh, the end of the hour and, and that went by so fast i feel like that's I a shame. Like that's a, yeah. hours on this. um and and i i mean would love to to grab uh, beers or dinner at some point with everybody and chat more on these on these topics so definitely um reach out to us on linkedin or um you know social um hit up bug crowd and, and casey and all the cool work they're doing um as we mentioned here's the resources that we have for um from the plex track side um but really appreciate uh first and foremost casey thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to visit me. with us in our, sure, in our audience today. same time. same with you nick thanks so so, so much for taking time and sharing your background joe as always thank you and uh, thanks to everybody for spending time with us this afternoon we we hope it was helpful um, reach out to us if you have any feedback or questions, or if you have any other topics that you'd like us to provide, um, you know, resources on and, and webinars in the, in the future. We're always looking for ways to continue to give back and help the community. So um, thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your afternoon um, and evening. Cheers. Later, y'all.